Canada brings you Meet the Press, the prize-winning interview program produced by Lawrence Spivak. Four of America's top news reporters are ready to interview in this unrehearsed conference Richard Scammon, Director of Elections Research of the Governmental in Affairs Institution. Here's the moderator of Meet the Press, Ned Brooks. Time magazine last week carried this description of the presidential election. It was so close that pundits, politicians, and the voters themselves will be debating for a long time just what the returns proved, what Kennedy's mandate was, and what might have gone differently. The answers to these questions involve such issues as religion, employment, and the influence of organized labor. Our guest today is Mr. Richard Scammon, a recognized authority on election returns and director of election research for the privately endowed Government Affairs Institute. Along with his studies of American elections, Mr. Scammon has served as an observer of elections in foreign countries, including Israel and the Soviet Union. We'll start the questions today with Mr. Spivak. Mr. Scammon, during this election, we heard a great deal about block voting. Can you tell us how much block voting actually developed and in what groups? Well, Mr. Spivak, if you mean by block voting that people of similar backgrounds and religious opinion, economic interests tend to vote the same way, uh, yes, this certainly not only developed but has existed in American politics and in politics all over the world uh, ever since politics began. You find, for example, that uh, Negro voters, farm voters, uh, wealthy voters, poor voters, men, women, young people, old people, all of them tend to identify certain interests together and oftentimes vote as groups for particular candidates. Well, Monsieur Lally, editor of a Boston Catholic Weekly, <clears throat> said the other day that the election proved beyond doubt that the voting pattern that appeared was not along religious lines, for example. Would you say that was true according to the analyses you have made? I would not say that there was no emphasis of religion in this campaign. I think that Catholic voters, who historically have been about three to one Democratic, uh, returned to the Democratic Party in very great numbers during this campaign. Now, they were Democratic, of course, um, under Roosevelt. They were Democratic for Harry Truman. They were Democratic for Congress in 58, and they were Democratic for Kennedy. I would say, too, that on the other side of this same question, in a number of areas in America, particularly in uh, what you might call the, the middle central part of the country, Arkansas, Tennessee, Kentucky, rural Missouri, Oklahoma. There was a considerable evidence of Protestant voting in um, areas that had been traditionally democratic, which had voted for Stevenson and which turned over and voted for Nixon in this election. Well, would you say that, that he lost uh, Oklahoma, Tennessee, and Kentucky because of anti-Catholic... Uh, I would say that this was the major reason, yes. Then there was a religious issue oh, yes, very definitely. Uh, of importance definitely. in those in those states. Yes. Well, now, on the other side, was there a religious issue that won him a state anywhere? I'd put it this way, uh, that there was a great surge of Catholic voters who had voted for Eisenhower in 52 and 56 and who now voted for Kennedy. I think, however, one must underline the fact that as Dr. Gallup pointed out in his poll of the 58th congressional election, 75% of the Roman Catholics in this country voted Democratic in 1958 for Congress. 78 or 79% voted for Kennedy for president. So that what you really had in the Kennedy election was a return to the Democratic Party of Catholic voters. Would you say there was any one issue more than any other that determined the victory? No, I would say, I suppose, that if you really had to identify the principal issue, it was simply inheritance, the fact that most Americans still vote the way their parents voted, and that throughout the country, um, at least 80% of the people had their minds made up no matter who the candidates had been. There's one question I, I've wanted a long time to, to ask you, and that is this. How do you know, since the ballot is a secret ballot, how do you know uh, whether there's a Catholic block or whether there isn't one, whether there's a Jewish block or whether there isn't one, whether there's a labor block or whether there isn't uh, one. How can you tell? 
Well, there are two ways in which you can tell, Mr. Spivak. In the first place, take just one question of identifying Negro voting. You can identify areas in Atlanta and in St. Louis and in New York uh, in which all of the registered voters are Negro. Now, if this district votes consistently in certain patterns and other Negro districts in other parts of the country also vote that way, it's a fair premise that this is a Negro voting pattern. If you find that the voting precincts, which are composed entirely of people who own houses worth more than $50,000, consistently vote in a certain pattern all over the country, that is a reasonable premise as to how they're going to vote. The same thing applies to the Jewish voters, Catholic voters, farmers, and the like. Now, there are some areas in which you can't do this. You can't do it with young people, for example, in questions of youth versus aged uh, voting. You can't do it with men and women. In some foreign countries, they divide the ballots on this basis, uh, but until some local authority is prepared to help out the political scientists in America, uh, we'll just have to use poll data, that is, um, private survey research opinion data rather than actual voting results. Mr. Mazo. Uh, would these Catholic voters who return to the Democratic fold for Senator Kennedy and you're on the base of your research also have returned for Adlai Stevenson or Stuart Symington? I don't believe they would have returned for Governor Stevenson. I think the record of 1956 shows that Governor Stevenson could not secure the support of uh, a substantial majority of Catholic voters. How about S S now, Johnson and Symington and others? I would think that the great majority of these Catholic voters would have returned to the Democratic Party uh, for Symington, for Johnson, or for another Protestant Democratic candidate, just in the sense in which they did in 1958. Because in 1958, uh, in gubernatorial, senatorial, congressional campaigns all over America, the great majority of Catholics voted Democratic, and the great majority of the Democrats for whom those Catholics voted were Protestants. However, I think one must be realistic here and say that uh, it may well be that the fact that um, John Kennedy was a Catholic added an extra 2 or 3 percent to this movement of Catholic voters back to the Democratic Party. Well, was it enough to make him the president? in these big states, which were the important states. Well, Mr. Mazo, you have an interesting situation here. When, when a candidate wins election by 200,000 votes out of perhaps 70 million cast, which 200,000 was the 200,000 that elected him? I mean, uh, it could have been um, the Southerners, it could have been the Jewish voters, it could have been the Negroes, it could have been anybody, because such a group is so small uh, that really everyone can claim that they provided the margin of victory. Is there any accurate way of gauging uh, whether his religion was more of an asset than a liability in this thing, and perhaps maybe his greatest asset or his greatest liability? Well, as I say, in terms of the asset of Catholicism to uh, Senator Kennedy, it may have accounted for a few extra percentage points that a Protestant Democrat would not have gotten if he had run for president. But quite frankly, I don't think that was a great uh, difference. I would suggest that he certainly lost in the traditional areas of rural Protestant Democratic strength, like Oklahoma, Kentucky, Tennessee, and rural Missouri, which, uh, for example, Harry Truman carried very easily in 1948, and which um, Kennedy lost last Tuesday. Well, actually, lost uh, Kentucky and of those three states, Kentucky and Oklahoma, the ones he lost in New York and Illinois and these other states Tennessee. more than in Tennessee. And state. he lost the rural areas of Missouri. I make a distinction here between. But he carried the state of Missouri. That's right. But I make a distinction between St. Louis and Kansas City on the one hand as urban areas and the rest of the state as a rural. Uh, and, and the total result, though, what, 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 how did it weigh? You mean the balance between the That's two? That's right. I think this is very hard to establish because of the fact that the election was so close. Uh, in other words, any single factor which added a half a point to the Kennedy total important, did it. But they all did. In other words, uh, let's put it this way. How much importance was the demonstration against Senator Johnson and his wife in the hotel in Dallas just before the election? Could this have swung Texas? How important was the telephone call to uh, 
uh, the king's yeah. wife, you know. Uh, all these things uh, get so important that it, it's awfully hard to specify which one did it. Mr. McCormick. Uh, Mr. Scanlon, do you think there was any appreciable Catholic vote against Kennedy? You mean uh, a uh, Catholic vote against Kennedy because of his religion? Uh, yes. Well, because of that, well, they would, yes. <laughs> well, let's put it this way. I think that as we go into the returns in detail, we will probably find that the um, Roman Catholic voters who were better off financially, who had moved into the middle class, suburban voters, for example, uh, probably were more likely to vote Republican. But I would think this was not because Kennedy was a Catholic. This was simply because their economic interests led them to vote Republican. There was, for example, a, a dinner, the Al Smith Memorial Dinner, a few uh, weeks before the campaign ended up in New York. And here I think you had a wealthier group of Catholics um, who very obviously preferred Nixon to Kennedy because they felt that their economic interest or the economic interest of the country as they saw it uh, we needed uh, Nixon. And this I wouldn't call a religious vote. I'd say they simply were reacting to an economic situation. Well, perhaps I misunderstood you, but I thought you said a while ago that uh, being a Catholic may have given Kennedy two or three percentage yes. points more of a vote. Uh, but now, actually, you're saying that the Catholics voted their party politics uh, without regard to religion, aren't you? Well, what I think I said, Mr. McCormick, was that the great mass of Catholics who voted for Kennedy, voted for him because he was the Democratic candidate, there may have been two or three percentage points extra who voted for him, despite the fact that they were Republicans because he was a Catholic. That percentage I don't think would be very large. Well, that would mean then that being a Catholic actually is a political advantage from here on in in a presidential race in this country, would it? Not necessarily, because this would presume that the only issue upon which people cast their ballots uh, was uh, Catholicism. And there are so many issues. For example, we've cited some of the groups that voted heavily for Mr. Kennedy. Actually, he would never have been elected if a lot of um, native-born, white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, middle-class, non-trade union Americans hadn't voted for him, too. Mr. Lissagore. <clears throat> Mr. Scam, in the election produced what seemed to be a crazy quilt pattern. Some Democratic governors lost in states which Kennedy carried. Indiana went for Nixon, but uh, elected a Democratic uh, governor. What's ever become of straight-ticket voting in the United States? Well, actually, Mr. Lissagore, I don't think we had as much straight-ticket voting as most people uh, presume. In 1956, for example, President Eisenhower was elected uh, by a very large uh, majority, a landslide, and yet the Democrats retained control of both houses of Congress. Uh, we had a lot of this split-ticket voting uh, this past election on Tuesday, but we've had a lot of it uh, in the past as well, in 58, 56, and all the way back. I don't think this is a new phenomenon, though um, you've had many examples of it uh, in this last vote. Uh, some of Senator Kennedy's associates have analyzed the election by saying that Mr. Nixon wasted his time by campaigning in the South, alienated Negro voters in the North. Would you share that opinion? Well, this is hard to say because anyone can uh, post-mortem an election and say what mistakes were made. I think that uh, Mr. Nixon felt that he had an opportunity uh, to project his message and uh, win support amongst Negro voters and in the South as well. And therefore, he campaigned in both areas. Uh, indeed, um, Senator Kennedy campaigned in both areas, too. I would think that on the basis of the evidence, he did pretty well in the South. Actually, let's look at it this way. Um, until Mr. Eisenhower came along, Nobody had really done well for the Republicans in the South, except Hoover in the 28 election against Al Smith. Now, Mr. Nixon managed to hold a great deal of that support. The increase in the Democratic vote in the South in this last election only was a matter of two or three percentage points. And I would think that uh, Mr. Nixon did pretty well in the Southern states. A question about the women voters. Senator Kennedy seemed to create a good deal of uh, interest and excitement among women uh, voters. Uh, do the election returns bear out the fact that he uh, got most of the women votes or not? Well, I don't think we could tell from the election returns, but uh, opinion polls would um, indicate just the opposite. 
Opinion polls would indicate that women generally voted for Mr. Nixon about two or three percentage points more than men did. And that, as in previous elections, women tend to vote more Republican, more conservative, and that they did so vote in this past election than do men. Mr. Spivak. Mr. Skyman, uh, from your analysis of the figures and from your recollection of what you thought was going to happen before the election, uh, were there any surprises of any importance for you and what you learned? I think, Mr. Spivak, the biggest surprise is the growing menace of being a governor. And by that I mean that there were 27 governors up for election, this election. Thirteen of those governorships changed hands. There were 34 Senate seats, and only two of them changed hands. And you know, I would think that the old formula of get to be elected the governor, and then you might make the White House, uh, is being replaced by get to be elected governor, and you're on the pathway to oblivion. That the governorship is the death trap of American politicians. And the biggest surprise, I think, out of this election is the way in which Governors, Republican and Democratic, it didn't make any difference what party they were, uh, simply got uh, knocked down and trampled on in the rush of the voters. Well, why, why are senators so much in demand and why are governors been played down so much? What do you think well, is happening? I think the basic reason is that we are getting a tremendous demand on the part of governors to provide state services, roads, education, mental health, and so on and that many of our people are simply not willing to pay the price and increase state taxes, real estate taxes, income taxes, uh, various kinds of, of uh, excise taxes. And the result is that they tend to throw the governor out of office. And uh, beginning with Governor Furcolo, who missed the Democratic senatorial nomination in Massachusetts and running right through a whole series of gentlemen who've now been retired for office, uh, with all respect to the 50 governors who are now incumbents, I think they're in a very bad situation politically. Well, do you think it has anything to do with the growing importance of the federal government and the downgrading, the general downgrading of the state government? This may be a part of it, particularly the, the first uh, statement, that senators, by the very nature of the increase of international and uh, broad national problems, get an opportunity to discuss these and to project themselves more than do governors. This is quite possibly a part of it, yes. You think it has anything to do with television, which gives so many senators a national platform, but not so many governors? It may very well, yes. You it think this is well. a warning to Governor Rockefeller, who may have some ambition? Well, it would be a, a warning, I think, to any governor that um, this is not really the ideal place from which to launch a successful political career anymore. Well, one question I'd like to ask you, and I don't know whether you can answer it or not, but what do you think would have happened if President Eisenhower had once again been a candidate? I think he would have been reelected. On what do you base that? I think his general personal popularity uh, would have been sufficient to um, get him a third term. Uh, it's ironical, of course, that the anti-third term amendment, which was very largely a Republican uh, device, uh, prevented the party from retaining its uh, hold on the White House, but I think that's the situation. Does that Mr. mean then that personality still plays one of the leading parts? Oh, the very election? definitely. I would think that personality, along with inheritance and broad economic orientation, are the three most important things in making up people's minds. Mr. Mazel. On, on that score, could, uh, of course, this, this has to be a the guess, I guess, on your part, would Senator Goldwater or Governor Rockefeller have done better than Nixon and the, on the, for the Republican? I don't believe so. I think that either Governor Rockefeller or Senator Goldwater <coughs> would have done worse than uh, Mr. Nixon on, as a candidate. On what basis? Because basically Mr. Nixon represents a, a centrist, a middle-of-the-road approach for the Republican Party. And American political parties are always moving towards the middle, they don't want to take candidates from the right or from the left. This is why uh, Johnson and Humphrey on the Democratic side uh, were passed over uh, in uh, Los Angeles. And this is why I think either Goldwater or Rockefeller would have been a less successful candidate, because the adherents of the other wing of the party would have been less willing to support them than they were to support Nixon in the middle. Are the Democrats going to be in now for 20 years on the basis of your projections? You'll have to invite me back later to discuss that after the next election. Mr. McCormick, uh, 
Uh, now, Mr. Scanlon, uh, do you uh, do you think that the Republican vote this time, or that the Republicans voted in unprecedented numbers? It seems to me that the Republicans, for the first time, got a tremendous vote out. Well, everybody got a tremendous vote out, Mr. McCormick. We ran a total vote here of 68, uh, perhaps even 69 million. Uh, both parties um, broke records. Uh, Mr. Nixon got almost as many votes as uh, Mr. Eisenhower did in the landslide victories of 52 and 56. I think we just had a tremendous turnout of Republicans and Democrats and independents as well. Why? I think for two basic reasons. First, the television and radio debates projected the candidates to millions more people and had probably heard all of the candidates in the years since the Civil War. One persistent theme of Senator Kennedy's campaign was that the nation was declining in prestige. Could polls show the people uh, dissatisfied and unhappy about our prestige in the world? Yes, the polls should show this. Mr. Spivak, we have about three minutes, gentlemen. Uh, what contribution would you say the polls made toward, make towards better elections? And do you think that the polls this time proved themselves out? Well, I would think if anybody was happy with the results, it ought to be the pollsters, because they came awfully close. Uh, George Gallup uh, predicted a 51% and came out 50-plus. Uh, uh, I would think that the uh, private polls, which are commissioned by candidates in order to help them understand the public attitude, uh, were also useful in enabling the candidate to center his attention on what people were interested in. Now, whether this contributes to a good election or not is perhaps another question, but I would think, yes, it does, because it identifies to the candidate what people are really interested in and enables the candidate to concentrate on those interests. Mr. Mazo. On the basis of your statistical projections in California, who ultimately is going to carry that great state's 32 votes, Nixon or Kennedy? We just have to wait and see how those absentee ballots How do you rate. project it? The absentee ballots in California normally run about two to one Republican. But um, we don't know who's actually asked for absentee ballots this uh, year. And we'll just have to wait and see, Mr. Mazo. We just don't know. In other words, normally it would be Nixon. You would normally it would be Nixon, but if there is a very large proportion of uh, absentee votes amongst the Democrats, of course, they could keep it for uh, Kennedy. Mr. McCormick. Uh, Mr. Scammon, do you think there was a last-minute switch in the last 10 days before the election from Kennedy to Nixon? Well, of course, until we get to holding two elections a week from Labor Day on, we'll never be able to tell the, the true answer to this, but... Each of the polls indicated this, yes, that there was a, a high peak for the Kennedy campaign about 10 days before the election, and that then Nixon moved up from that time on. Mr. Lissagore. Uh, do your studies tell you what happened in Ohio, which doesn't seem to me to be very different from western Pennsylvania and southern Michigan? Yet Ohio went for Nixon, and the other two states went for Kennedy. Actually, Mr. Lizagore, Ohio shifted just about the same as Michigan and Pennsylvania, about eight percentage points towards Kennedy. The difference was that the Republicans started with more in Ohio, and therefore, when they ended up on the short end of an eight percentage point switch, they were still ahead. That was about all. Mr. Spivak. You've told us why so many people have voted. Will you tell us why so many people don't? I think there's something like 40 million people who haven't voted. Well, Mr. Spivak, a lot of people don't vote because they can't vote. Uh, under our election laws, they are illiterates. They are residents of the District of Columbia and can't ballot. Uh, they don't meet the legal requirements of residents. They don't pay a poll tax. You might have had as many as 15 million in this category. Many others don't vote because um, they aren't interested. They haven't been activated. This is the responsibility of the political parties and the candidates. Uh, to coin a phrase, there's no such thing as a bad voter. There are only bad politicians who don't activate voters. Mr. McCormick. Uh, Mr. Scavin, how much effect do you think uh, President Eisenhower had in his sort of belated efforts in the campaign? I think he had some, but again, uh, in the absence of this uh, twice-a-week election from Labor Day on, we won't know exactly what that effect was. Mr. Mazo? What's Senator Johnson's effect on the Democratic victory? I think undoubtedly Senator Johnson helped in the South, uh, though here uh, the increase in popular vote wasn't a great deal.
what you have to ask yourself is what would have been the position in the South if Senator Johnson were not the vice presidential candidate? Gentlemen, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I see that our time is up. Monitors, thanks to Richard Scammon, Director of Elections Research of the Governmental Affairs Institution and the members of the Meet the Press panel, Peter Lissagor of the Chicago Daily News, Earl Mazur of the New York Herald Tribune, Robert McCormick of NBC News, and Mr. Lawrence Spivak. Meet the Press will not be heard next week because of a special program. We'll, we'll be here at its regular monitor spot 